İstanbul Aydın University. I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank you all for your participation. Let me introduce first the participants. Mr. Ambassador Faruk Loğlu, retired former Turkish ambassador to the USA. Mrs. Defne Arslan, senior director, Atlantic Council in Turkey and Turkey representative, Atlantic Council. Dr. George Chogopoulos, is it correct? Thank you very much, my friend. Dr. George Chogopoulos, lecturer, European Institute of Nice. Associate Professor, Dr. Michael Reynold, Near Eastern Studies and Director of the Program in Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies at Princeton University. Dr. Faris Ismailzadeh, Executive Vice Rector at Ada University in Azerbaijan. Dr. Farid Gulev, Head of Department, Political Science and Philosophy, Hazar University, Azerbaijan. Dr. Jeffrey Mankov, Unfortunately, he is not here yet. The purpose of this panel, as you know, to discuss USA-Turkey relations in the context of global and regional issues and to find at the end possible solution, if we can. We plan the panel in three sessions, in three parts. Each session will be about 30 minutes. In each session, I would like to ask each of you one question. I would be very happy if you could answer each question in five minutes at the most. The president of Istanbul Aydın University, unfortunately, will not be able to make the planned opening speech because or due to unexpected situation. But I do hope that our president will be able to give his closing speech at the end of the panel. Now, let me pose the first question to Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Lowell. Turkey and USA had extensive relations, as you know, Mr. Ambassador, at all levels on bilateral, regional, and global issues. However, tensions have been rising between the two countries in recent years. Is it possible for you to evaluate the reasons for the tension in recent years between Turkey and the USA? Please taking into account that Turkey has been a member of NATO since 1952. Mr. Ambassador. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, organizing this uh, uh, panel. Uh, it's uh, timely and it's important to answer your question uh, within the time limit you set. Uh, I think there are uh, uh, reasons on both sides of the fence uh, for the current state of relations between Turkey and the United States. Uh, on the U.S. side, uh, we have an administration uh, now and uh, before it, uh, the Trump administration. Uh, I think uh, uh, American policy toward Turkey is uh, uh, determined uh, by exogenous uh, factors, especially uh, the position taken by the uh, uh, Jewish lobby, the Armenian lobby, and the Greek lobby. Uh, Plus, of course, uh, the impact of uh, the media and think tanks, uh, think tanks in the in the U.S. Uh, President Biden himself, uh, as well as uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, have recently uh, uh, upped the tension in Turkish uh, uh, American relations by uh, recognizing, uh, officially recognizing, Armenian claims of uh, genocide. Uh, what is different today? Uh, is that uh, uh, before Turkish-American uh, ties uh, faced uh, equally important challenges. But this is the first time uh, when uh, uh, uh, problems, whether bilateral, regional, or uh, otherwise, 
uh, have kept accumulating, have kept uh, uh, growing bigger uh, without really uh, finding uh, uh, a solution to uh, any particular uh, uh, challenge that, uh, that the two sides uh, face. And I think this, uh, this is, uh, this, uh, uh, is uh, attributable uh, to uh, a lack of uh, uh, strategic perception of what Turkey represents in the current uh, setting of international affairs. Uh, the basic strategic mistake uh, made uh, by the US, uh, made by Trump, by George Bush, and uh, currently continuing by President Biden, uh, is uh, uh, that uh, to fight radical Islam, uh, you need moderate Islam. You don't fight Islam with Islam. That's uh, that's uh, that is uh, that is uh, uh, that will take you nowhere. And I think uh, this uh, uh, uh, basic motive uh, is explains uh, the uh, the stance of the U.S. Uh, toward Turkey. As for the Turkish part, uh, Turkey is a country, especially in the last uh, ten years, uh, is a country uh, that has foreign relations but that has no foreign policy. I think uh, uh, it, uh, it is uh, uh, moving in all directions, but without uh, a consistent uh, vision uh, of uh, uh, where Turkey should be, because according to our constitution, we are a democratic, secular uh, state uh, and uh, uh, where the rule of law prevails. Uh, this is not the case in Turkey today. And uh, foreign relations are, uh, merely used by the by those in power in Turkey today as an extension of their uh, domestic political uh, needs. So uh, at the end of the day, Turkish-American relations uh, have uh, hit their lowest point in uh, uh, recent years uh, with really no uh, prospect uh, of, uh, uh, of an exit uh, from this uh, toward uh, a better balanced, consistent and rational relationship. Thank you. Uh, your microphone. Thank you very much for your comment, Mr. Ambassador. Mrs. Defna Arslan, according to the USA and NATO officials, as you know, Turkey is an important organization. Ally since 1952 as well. Let me ask again, please. Sorry. According to the USA and NATO officials, Turkey is an important NATO ally and a, crit a critical regional partner. Turkey has been a North Atlantic Treaty Organization's ally since 1952 as well. Turkey is also an important security partner of the USA in the region. Isn't the aim to keep Turkey connected to the Atlantic community? If this is the case, what do you think about the USA policies towards Turkey or vice versa from Turkey to the USA? Um, uh, Professor Babirola, thank you for the question and inviting me to this USAM panel. And I'd like to greet also my fellow panelists and distinguished participants with this occasion. Um, the, that's a very good question, you know, just um, in the in the surface, when we look at the daily media, this is the picture that we see and we read about, uh, you know, analysts at all times. But on the other hand, uh, how we see myself and also Atlantic Council is that, you know, just Turkey is not, uh, is has always been a very important uh, security partner and the most important actor of the southern flank of uh, NATO since 1952. And Turkey also has proven itself to be a, you know, dependent partner since then uh, at many occasions, you know, just uh, for NATO. So nothing will really change that despite the rhetoric that about its 400 purchase of Turkey, which I also think that has been a very big strategic mistake. Uh, on the Turkish front, uh, you know, bringing the Turkey's importance only to S-400 issue and uh, coming up with an idea that Turkey is not a dependable NATO ally uh, is an illusion. Uh, yes, Turkey did a strategic mistake. Uh, 
and now uh, with, with both sides, they are trying to find a solution to that. We all know that uh, Turkey has already been sanctioned uh, because of that. The cost of sanctions are in place, uh, by the way, which have been uh, put in, uh, into action you know, during the previous administration. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what is uh, what is a fact is that you know just right now uh, there is an intention with this new administration and also on the Turkish side uh, to put things back on track. You know, just there has been huge tensions and both sides made strategic mistakes. You know, uh, US did on Syria, Turkey did with S S four hundreds. And uh, and we all, as uh, our you know distinguished ambassador also just mentioned, there are also a lot of you know anti uh, lobby efforts very active in Washington D.C. through also Congress channels as well, which we do know. For this reason, you know, just this is a time that you know just uh, I think two old allies need to come together and find a solution, which I do think that this is also in you know just uh, moving forward. Uh, I also see a serious intention with the Biden administration uh, to put things back on track uh, with Turkey as well. Yes, S-400 is a serious issue and there needs to be a solution uh, for this. And unfortunately, due to the U.S. law in place, uh, without taking, uh, you know, Turkey taking an action with that front, you know, it will be very difficult, you know, just to remove the cost of sanctions. Uh, but uh, there's an intention, and I do think that, you know, there is no, uh, and the current administration is very sincere about, you know, just why Turkey is important and, uh, you know, to put the things back uh, as they move forward, you know, just in history. Thank you very much for your comments. And Mr. Reynolds? Associate Professor, Mr. Reynolds. Would you like to comment on these statements made by Mrs. Daphne? I, I agree uh, uh, by and large uh, with everything that uh, Daphne said. Um, and I also uh, agree by and large with the comments of uh, Ambassador Lolu. In fact, I'd like to steal uh, his description of Turkish foreign policy and apply it to American foreign policy. That I think it's more uh, uh, currently foreign relations, a collection of foreign relations as opposed to a, a, a broad policy. Um, <clears throat> that I think I agree both that's an apt description of Turkish foreign policy, and I think it's probably not a bad one for American um, uh, right now. Uh, on, on the question of uh, the current state of, of Turkish uh, and American relations, um, there is, I if, if one were to, I think there is reasons for optimism for an improvement. Recently, I think both uh, Ankara and Washington, D.C. have walked themselves back from uh, what looked like almost a breaking point uh, just a few years ago. And I think um, that, you know, the reasons uh, for that from the American side certainly uh, are that, you know, Turkey's importance comes down to, uh, there are many reasons for Turkey's importance, but particularly, I think within the last year, uh, that importance can be summed up in three words, geography, geography, geography. Um, and by that, I mean specifically what's going on right now in Ukraine, uh, that with, as the United States has faced this crisis with, with Russia, uh, it's been quite remarkable how the tone in Washington uh, towards Turkey has shifted and uh, Turkey's aid to Ukraine, particularly the selling of uh, drones, has been much celebrated uh, by people in Washington. And again, suddenly now Turkey looks like a key uh, uh, uh, ally uh, and partner of the United States. And, you know, that is uh, Turkey's geography, not simply uh, to the south of Russia and on the Black Sea and uh, effectively a neighbor of, uh, of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, but the other area where uh, Turkey's geography is that in the, has been uh, quite important is that in the Caucasus. And is the war uh, <clears throat> in 2020 uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia demonstrated, uh, the United States was almost entirely absent uh, from that conflict. Uh, it was sat on the diplomatic sidelines and was really uh, wholly in ineffective, um, which is something that uh, uh, was quite telling 
I think, uh, the, the absence of the uh, United States. And that also sort of understood the importance of, uh, underscored uh, the importance of Turkey to the United States. That is, if the United States is not going to be able to project power and influence um, into a region like the Caucasus, it will be useful for it at least to have some sort of influence over a country like Turkey that can. That is, to have good relations with Turkey so that um, to, to some extent it might uh, be able to protect uh, its own uh, relations. And I think also likewise, the, you know, that conflict in uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan also demonstrated the limits to U.S. Uh, power, which has been something that Washington D.C. has been very uh, slow uh, to recognize. And I think that's I'm speaking as an American citizen. I think that's been to the great damage of American foreign policy is that we uh, our uh, leadership over the course of the past 20 years has. Um, both uh, overextended the United States and squandered the tremendous amount of resources the U.S. has. And I mean resources in all forms, military, uh, financial resources, and also, say me, particularly with speaking about Turkey, goodwill. Goodwill of, of countries that have been uh, long-term allies and partners. And, and Turkey is one of those. Uh, and because of the, the actions of the United States, and I would say very short-sighted policies on the part of the United States, we have uh, alienated uh, many Turks and lost a lot of the goodwill that we had uh, with Turkey. Um, and the reasons for that, are, you know, the two most important, there are many, but the two most important are uh, that of the American, uh, not simply collaboration, but the arming and training of the YPG, which is in effect a, an arm of the PKK, which is, again, I think is something as a, a student of uh, Turkish uh, history and politics would be the one thing I would advice I would give to any country is if you wish to have good relations with Turkey is please do not cooperate with let alone arm and train uh, the PKK. Um, yet the United States has done precise, precisely that. And the other, uh, I think, really astounding um, uh, American uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Turkey that's only the Turks has been uh, the support, be it passive or active, of Fethullah Gulen, who currently is still inside the United States. And I won't go into the, the, the details of that, but that's been another um, area that, uh, that, in fact, I'm surprised that Turkish-American relations aren't worse than they are currently. Now, there are a number of things that Turkey has done on its part that have alienated the United States. Those are undermining the sanctions with Iran, uh, the purchase of the S-400s, which is also a tremendous mistake by Turkey for its own purposes, and then also Turkish uh, support for uh, Hamas, which uh, also has uh, alienated a great many uh, people in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere in the United States. Um, but I want to go over uh, uh, the five minutes, so I gladly expand on some of these points uh, later if you'd like me to. Thank you. Just just a short answer, please, Mr. Reynolds. Uh... May I have your assessment on S-400 air defense system? Short answer, please. Yeah, so I, I, I think that was absolutely a huge, uh, a major mistake by Turkey. I understood you know, the, the, the signal that Turkey wanted to send is so we have options to the United States. We can purchase arms from Russia, for example. But then they went and purchased a, uh, an arms system that was both extraordinarily expensive, but one that can't really not, cannot be easily deployed. So I don't understand it's been able to do any good for Turkey. And then by purchasing that system, it also Turkey locked itself out of the F-35 program which was not only important for, it was not only only the United States, but again, that was a program that would have brought Turkey a great deal of income and also expertise in developing its own arms industry, which has been one of the most important uh, success stories of Turkey in, this, in, in the region more generally has been Turkey's uh, success in building up its own um, defense industry. Uh, and, and has been able to emerge as an independent player. And that is a long story that goes back, I would say, to the foundings of the, of the Turkish Republic. And in fact, I would even be tempted to say it goes back prior to that, but we won't get into history right now. But the S-400s, I think, was, um, you know, Turkey, and to use a, a football analogy, scored an own goal with that. That it was a tremendous mistake that uh, did damage to itself, but also damaged relations with the United States. Thank you very much for your comments. Thanks a lot. Mr. Ismail Zade, uh, leaders from time to time talk about the strategic importance of relations between Turkey and US USA. Are there any possibilities to solve the important issues, especially YPG, PKK, terrorist organizations? What do you think about that, sir? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this invitation, and I'm very honored to be part of this discussion. You're welcome. I, uh, you asked me about uh, PKK and some other uh, terrorist organizations. 
But uh, let me just uh, draw your attention to our region, region of South Caucasus. Uh, we saw that, um, you know, the recent war in Karabakh and liberation of Azerbaijan's territories uh, was possible due to political and strategic support of Turkey. And Turkey became very active player in South Caucasus. Uh, it has been active player economically and energy security wise, but nowadays Turkey is also present very much actively in terms of military and politics. So we see that Turkey is a very uh, effective and very result oriented regional power. Uh, we also see very active role of Turkey in other parts of uh, the region, such as uh, Ukraine crisis, which was mentioned by Professor Reynolds, um, as well as on uh, uh, providing energy security for the Southern Europe. So those issues where Turkey plays a very active role. Uh, that's why I believe that there is a big potential for cooperation, strategic cooperation between U.S. and Turkey on these outstanding issues. I think Turkey can continue being a strong NATO ally in our region, pursuing NATO policies in the region. And for that, uh, Turkey needs uh, strong support from U.S. when it comes to PKK issue and the issue of uh, Kurdish terrorists in Iraqi territory and Syrian territory. So this would be my answer. But generally, I would say that Turkish role, Turkey's role in the region has dramatically increased over the past couple of years. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Mr. Jeffrey Menge, welcome to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey, is the Russian made S-400 air defense system? an important obstacle in Turkey and the USA relations? What uh, about this issue? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for having me on the panel. Um, regarding the S-400, I would say that yes, it is one of the major uh, obstacles to the improvement of the US-Turkish relationship right now. Um, the US and other NATO allies have made clear that they oppose um, the presence of this system in Turkey because of concerns that it could uh, be used to gather intelligence on advanced systems, notably the F-35 uh, from which Turkey was uh, expelled, um, and that that information could then be uh, transferred to Russia. Moreover, because um, of the military technical relationship with Russia that underpins the, the purchase of the S-400, um, there's concern about what it does for the larger um, political strategic relationship between Moscow and Ankara. Now that said, I think there are multiple uh, ideas that have been floated on how um, the dispute over Turkey's purchase of this system can uh, be resolved in a way that um, allows uh, Washington and Ankara to get back to a place of, of greater trust, excuse me, and cooperation. And whether this is um, an agreement to um, not bring the system into uh, operation, not bring it into operation, uh, whether it's to, um, you know, operate it under uh, NATO supervision, uh, which Russia probably would not allow, whether it's um, to transfer it um, somewhere else. There are multiple um, options that have been explored, and I think that um, those options are going to continue to be explored. Um, but uh, for now, until some kind of resolution of, of this issue is is found, uh, I think it's going to be a, a continued irritant in the bilateral relationship. Thank you very much. Do you, do, do you have any comments uh, on the uh, Reynolds or the other speakers? On the Caucasus or um, anything like that? Um, you know, I, sorry, I um, unfortunately had to join the panel a little bit late, so I didn't hear uh, all of Professor Reynolds' comments. But um, on the Caucasus, you know, I think that um, Turkey's involvement in the in the Nagorno-Karabakh war was uh, significant, and it really changed the the regional lineup uh, in ways that are still being felt. Uh, one potential consequence uh, that we're still seeing some um, movement around is the potential for normalization of the relationship with Armenia. Um, politically, that's going to be very difficult uh, internally in Armenia, but I think there's a recognition on the part of the leadership that um, having pretty comprehensively lost the war and with very little 
to be gained at this point from uh, clinging to a military solution. The only way to uh, reintegrate into uh, the global economy and rebuild the, the transportation and other networks that were closed off during the first Nagorno-Karabakh war is to pursue this path of normalization with both Turkey and Azerbaijan. Um, again, it'll be politically difficult, but I think that there is a role there to be played uh, by the United States, by um, some of the, the rest of the international community um, in pushing in that direction. And I think that there is also, um, from what I've seen, interest in, in this um, direction coming from, from both Ankara and Baku. So um, I'm at least cautiously optimistic that um, there'll be uh, an openness to making progress on this issue over the, over the coming year. Of course, we've been here before, you know, there was the, the Zurich protocols, um, a decade or so ago, um, at a time when it seemed like um, maybe some of the of the legacy of the first war could be uh, could be overcome, and for a variety of reasons that that didn't succeed. So I think we need to be cautious about um, predicting too much, and I think the role of Russia is still um, something of a wild card here. Um, but at the same time, uh, if there is to be a, um, a silver lining to to the conflict, uh, I think the fact that the, the political knot. Um, that emerged uh, with the Soviet collapse and the <clears throat> and the first war in Nagorno-Karabakh may be um, slightly loosening right now. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your comment. And uh, uh, Dr. George Chogopoulos, welcome again, my friend. Thank you very much for your participation. Considering Turkey-U.S. relations what do you think about the current state of Turkey-EU relations? Thank you very much, uh, Director Baburoglu, for this kind invitation. It is uh, great to see that uh, my university is uh, expanding on its cooperation with Aydin University that started last year, and I'm very glad that we are making steps together in 2022 in discussing these uh, important uh, issues. Uh, I would like to start with a, a general uh, remark, uh, which is also relevant to what Daphne said before. I think that the most important thing to uh, explore is uh, up to what extent the foreign policy, the general foreign policy of uh, President Biden is different from that of Donald Trump, and up to what extent this impacts on US-Turkey relations. Uh, because it is... Uh, uh, evident that uh, President Biden is very much interested uh, in uh, revitalizing NATO and in uh, uh, bringing uh, American partners together uh, in an effort for them to solve differences. And uh, it seems to me that this is having a critical impact on uh, how Turkey's foreign policy has evolved in 2022 vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but vis-a-vis -vis also other regional uh, uh, players uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Middle East, uh, Africa, and uh, beyond. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, it seems that uh, the United States is uh, trying to see up to what extent uh, our conditions of stability can be created in its interest at first to restrain the influence of China. And in that regard, the role of Turkey acquires significance to a much higher extent, in my opinion. From a European perspective, again, the question is up to what extent transatlantic relations can be revitalized in the Biden years in comparison to the Trump years, which is partly happening despite existing differences. And up to what extent this recontextualization and this uh, uh, bringing of the transatlantic partnership uh, back to track is impacting on relations between Europe and Turkey and how US foreign policy's choices are uh, influencing the uh, relations between uh, uh, Europe and Turkey. Serious problems are existing, uh, which have been uh, monitored uh, and recorded in all EU uh, policy documents. At the same time, I would say, however, that uh, what needs to be explored in uh, more detail in the coming months, especially in view of important EU meetings that would take place in March, 
is up to what extent the EU strategic autonomy concept that will perhaps take the form of what is being called in Brussels uh, as a strategic compass will be viewed in Turkey because over the previous years, Turkey is a little bit skeptical about EU uh, steps towards strategic autonomy due to uh, the impact that, such, that these steps might have on EU NATO cooperation. So it is here where we are, discussions are continuing, but obviously the situation is better in comparison to last year. Thank you very much for your comment, thanks a lot. Now, uh, Dr. Ferit Guliev, in terms of bringing geopolitics of energy back in, may I have your comment on European energy security amid Russia-Ukraine tensions? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be part of this uh, panel of distinguished speakers. Uh, so I'm... Uh, uh, professor at uh, Hazar University in Baku, Azerbaijan. So yeah, um, exactly. So I think it's a very uh, important uh, aspect of what is going on uh, in uh, tensions that are happening in Europe uh, over Ukraine and how this impacts energy security. So I would like to comment on that. Uh, so I think what is... Um, um, what is actually happening in Europe is quite interesting from the point of view that um, the uh, uh, European uh, po policy to try to transition to uh, renewable sources actually backfired in, in the following way, that uh, European countries um, and adopted all sorts of policies in which they are trying to sort of um, phase out traditional fossil fuels, such as oil, natural, uh, you know, gas, and, and uh, especially coal uh, plants have been, uh, are being phased out in uh, European countries, but uh, which is uh, ultimately uh, is a very good uh, sort of goal that it, it will in the long run increase uh, European uh, energy security because it will make European countries less dependent on external supplies. But in the uh, short uh, to medium term, um, uh, these policies actually uh, are increasing the role of uh, increasing the weight that of natural gas, right? Because natural gas is considered a clean alternative to to uh, coal, and some countries are would just have to increase uh, imports of natural gas and the. Uh, country that is most likely to benefit from this uh, policy is Russia. So in the medium term, Russia's geopolitical uh, sort of uh, power is uh, being increased uh, because of these renewable policies that are uh, being uh, implemented in uh, EU member states. Um, and um, we know that uh, Russia now has a second uh, pipeline uh, that is uh, uh, completed, uh, Nord Stream 2, uh, which also makes Russia less dependent on uh, Ukraine as a transit, transit uh, country. And in a way also sort of increases uh, uh, Russia's uh, leverage and the power it can, it can wield uh, in uh, diplomatic negotiations with European countries, also in the context of uh, diplomatic efforts to resolve the Ukrainian crisis. So it also limits the options that, uh, that Euro some European countries have. For example, we see that how um, Germany's policy towards Russia is a bit moderated also because uh, Germany is heavily dependent on Russian gas for its energy security. So what I'm trying to uh, what I would uh, argue is that um, in, uh, yeah, and we know that Russia has been using this sort of energy weapon in the past. It happened um, uh, in 2006, uh, uh, Gazprom cut off uh, <clears throat> gas supplies to Ukraine in 2009. And all this uh, in 2014, when uh, uh, Russia annexed Crimea, Russia also cut off uh, supplies to Kiev. Um, <clears throat> Moral, moreover, in the uh, uh, fourth quarter of 2021, Russia also reduced the 
supplies of natural gas to Europe. And some uh, analysts are uh, seeing this as an effort by Russia to uh, prop up uh, energy prices. Um, European short uh, storage inventories are currently being at the lowest levels. And um, um, some experts are also uh, expecting that uh, Russia might totally cut off uh, supplies to Europe in the event of uh, uh, Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, so what are the options for uh, EU in the medium term? So um, European countries can obviously increase um, imports of LNG gas, uh, which is something that is already happening to try to compensate for what is uh, the uh, reduced amounts that are being transported uh, from, from Russia. But it can also, um, they can also, what they can also do, they can try to expand existing uh, capacity, throughput capacity of the Southern Gas Corridor, which is, um, um, which is an important uh, energy uh, project that hasn't, unfortunately hasn't received as much attention as the previous oil pipeline, which is the Bakut Bilisi Jehan pipeline. So um, the current capacity of the, um, as we know, this uh, gas corridor consists of a, uh, of a series of uh, interlinked pipelines that is a connected one a leg of this pipeline is a trans Adriatic pipeline. Um, uh, and uh, at the uh, current capacity of, it, it's not being used at the, at the full capacity. And so one way for, uh, I would say for European countries to try to mitigate the impact of um, um, energy um, sh shortage is to, um, in, to support expansion of, uh, of the uh, top pipeline. Uh, to, there is a possibility to expand it uh, at least uh, uh, twice to, to 20 uh, a billion cubic meters uh, a year. Um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> in this way, I would, I would say that as, a, uh, as uh, Professor Reynolds mentioned, Turkey is playing now an increasingly more important role because of its geography. And, um, and uh, geograph geographically, and it's also it, it reinforces its role as an uh, energy transit hub for Azerbaijani gas. Thank you very much for your comment. Mr. Ferit, thank you very much. Now I am going to pose uh, these questions to Mr. Ambassador, to Dr. Ismail Zadeh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey, and to Mr. Reynolds. Uh, as you know, S-400 air system, air defense system, YPG, PKK terrorist organization, Eastern Mediterranean. When you consider these significant issues, 222 this year is going to be a hard year for the USA and Turkey, Turkish relations, isn't it? May I ask your evaluation, please, Mr. Ambassador? It uh, certainly is going to be a very difficult year in uh, Turkish American relations, and not just uh, for, for those two countries, but you know, going through a very severe and continuing pandemic. It's going to be a tough year for, for the entire occupants of our humble planet. But as for Turkish-American relations, you are absolutely right in asking this question. And I want to emphasize three points. Number one, the S-400 issue, I agree, it was a strategic mistake, but it was not a single act. It is, it is a process. It's still continuing. I mean, uh, Turkey never uh, said that, that, oh, oh, we made a mistake. We are really trying to uh, find a way out. No, uh, Turkey is looking forward to uh, purchasing a second batch uh, of uh, S-400s uh, more developed than the previous generation, but not. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, uh, uh, you have to look at the trajectory of uh, Turkish-Russian relations uh, in order to grasp uh, better uh, Turkish-American relations. Uh, Turkish-Russian relations have always been important, but it is uh, now a relationship that's, uh, that is really taking the shape of 
dependence by Turkey on Russia, uh, certainly economy, commerce, tourism, uh, and defense, uh, but most importantly, uh, energy dependency of Turkey on uh, Russia. And uh, Putin, I think, uh, is a very, very uh, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, leader uh, making uh, good use of uh, Turkey's uh, dependence on Russia, whether on the issue of Ukraine or on the Armenian Azerbaijan issue and whatnot. That's uh, that's point number one. Number two, uh, I would like to share the optimism uh, expressed by a lot of the panel, a number of panelists uh, here, uh, uh, that the Biden administration is making a, a, a better effort than the Trump administration to mend relations with uh, Turkey. I disagree. I, I really disagree with this. I think uh, the point in Turkey uh, often made is that uh, Biden will depend uh, on uh, institutions uh, rather than a person-to-person -person relationship with President Erdogan. Yeah, there are institutions in the U.S., but there are no there are <laughs> their counterparts in Turkey do not really exist. It is just one man show, President Erdogan's show. So it is, uh, as far as Turkey is concerned, it's still one man show. Now, why Biden cannot revitalize the Turkish American relationship? Number one, his recognition, official recognition of Armenian claims of genocide. That is an uh, injection uh, into uh, a, a permanent uh, source of tension between Turkey and the uh, United States uh, with ramifications that are still to unfold, like uh, compensation claims, property claims uh, filed by uh, uh, Armenian Americans in US courts. Uh, there is also the question of uh, Biden's support uh, on Aegean questions, on uh, uh, the Cyprus question on the Eastern Mediterranean, in uh, Syria, the YPG referred to by others here. So uh, I, I don't really uh, uh, see uh, any uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel uh, as far as uh, uh, Turkish-American relations is concerned. And one last word, very briefly, uh, on the Armenian-Turkish uh, rapprochement recently. I think it's a good idea. I think it, this can be worked out, especially uh, uh, uh, learning the lessons of uh, 2009, the protocols, experience, and so forth. Uh, but I, it has to be done very slowly, uh, very carefully. And I think Armenian diaspora is going to probably uh, exert a negative influence on this process because they will insist and work on President Biden that not only Biden recognize Armenian genocide, but Turkey also must recognize Armenian genocide. So we have to be uh, on the lookout uh, for that danger. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Reynold, the same question, please. You, the, so the, the, if you can remind me what the question was, because this is uh, the conversation has gone in so many uh, directions. Um, about the future of Turkish-American relations, or I think you started asking about the S-400s, if, if I recall. Yeah, uh, so just let me repeat it. S-400 air defense system, YPG, PKK, terrorist organization, Eastern Mediterranean. When you consider these issues, significant issues, what do you think about this year? This year, okay, uh, yes. It's going uh, to be hard year for the USA, Turkish relations, or are you optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, I'm generally a pessimist, but I, I think for the relatively short term for this year, I'm relatively optimistic about Turkish American relations. Um, and the reason for that is I think there, again, there's been a recognition of Ankara and Washington, um, uh, going back a few years that we, they really hit it bottom and they made a choice not to go further. And I think that realization is still there that things could get worse and there's a desire on both sides that they don't get worse. I think as uh, Ambassador Lillo though said, one of the difficulties in improving relationships is the absence of institutions in, in Turkey. Um, that is a that is a, a real problem. Uh, the other, I think, serious problem is that, and I think that one of the biggest dynamics behind the fraying in American-Turkish relations is, is the decline of American uh, power and that both Turkey and the United States are trying to adjust uh, 
uh, to that. And in some ways, the United States has been both quite frustrated by Turkey doing things on its own in defiance with the United States or not in, not in uh, concert with the United States. But I think Turkey has also felt that it has had to do those things because the United States has been absent. And again, you know, one good example of that was what took place uh, most recently in the Caucasus. But one could see that uh, prior in the war in 2008 uh, between uh, Georgia and, and Russia, where Turkey sort of had to look to itself, um, in, in part because, um, you know, without going into the details there, if you had a, a, a country, if you can't call it technically an, an ally with the United States, but that one that was very close to the United States, Georgia, uh, precipitated that war. Granted, it was very much provoked by Russia into doing that, but that sort of, I mean, the United States was playing a very dangerous game, and it was one, I think, that Turkey, the Ankara, understood we're going to be the ones that are going to pay for that, just as Turkey has paid more for what's taken place in Syria and in uh, Iraq. And I think that has shaken sort of confidence inside of Turkey in uh, U.S. foreign policy, that when it does make mistakes, it's been Turkey in many cases that's been uh, paying uh, the, the greater price. Um, and many of the mistakes, I think, again, speaking as an American, the many of the foreign policy mistakes the United States has committed over the past 20 years, uh, America has been isolated from the cost of those mistakes by its wealth and by its geography. Uh, that is, you know, the sorts of refugee flows outside of uh, Afghanistan and in Syria haven't really hit the United States the way they've hit the, the neighbors of those countries. Um, and likewise, the cost of the war economically uh, have hit the United States, but not so badly that it can be uh, th that the economic problems of the United States can be tied directly to those uh, wars. And I think, you know, this is in the, the, the ongoing crisis with the Russia. I mean, it's still very mu up, much up in the air. How is this going to be resolved? Um, you know, th this could be resolved in sort of a victory of the United States in the sense of demonstrating the limits to Russian power. On the other hand, I think that uh, Russia has already uh, sent the message that there is there are fractures between the United States and its European allies, that the United States uh, military is not quite the uh, deterrent um, that the Americans would like to think it is. I think you know everyone recognizes that if Russia wants to go into Ukraine, it can. It has military support, superiority in Europe. The question is, you know, it, it will will the economic uh, effects that the United States could inflict on Russia? And if it comes to that, if Russia does invade and there is a real falling out between Russia and the United States, you know, it's clear that the United States is not going to be a victor of that, nor will Russia, and that will be China. Um, and so again, this comes back to I think that whether the bigger biggest questions here is the relative decline in, in American power. And the question is, will American uh, foreign, will American diplomats and statesmen and stateswomen uh, be more effective in using uh, the tools of American power and the resources of American power uh, that are still there? Or will they continue to make the sorts of mistakes that send them at, or compel countries like Turkey to act on their own in defense of their own uh, uh, interests? Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds, for your comments. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Ismail Zadeh, uh, if you want, I can repeat the same question. No, no, I would like to comment on these questions, yeah. uh, on this question. You yeah. know, the, the, the real situation is that Turkey has changed a lot and it has stopped considering itself as a periphery, periphery for European Union, for NATO. Um, Turkey does not, uh, doesn't want to, um, you know, align all of its foreign policy priorities with uh, Euro-Atlantic community, but it wants to act on its own. And it, uh, on certain issues, Turkey has, uh, you know, acted to defend itself, uh, whether it is uh, terrorist attacks from uh, Kurdish separatists, whether it is the issue of um, air defense systems, uh, those are the issues where Turkey did not get a lot of support from the United States and it had, had to act on its own. So therefore, we need to understand that Turkey has changed. Turkey is now a regional actor on its own. It is no longer has to uh, you know, define and uh, promote its uh, foreign policy objectives in line with Western interests or Western uh, dictations. So this is the current reality. And in that context, our relationship with Russia, some military cooperation, increasing trade, increasing regional security architecture with Russia is part of Turkish foreign policy and part of reality. We saw it in Karabakh issue where Western alliances, Western organizations did not produce any results. And it was really Turkey and Russia that came together and created a new security arrangement and security architecture for South Caucasus without much US involvement, without much 
involvement of uh, France and other, uh, you know, OEC leaders. Uh, we also see that increasing uh, cooperation with Russia in terms of energy security, new pipelines, uh, the increasing uh, cooperation in nuclear energy issues, the construction of new uh, nuclear power stations. So all of these are part of reality. And I think United States should take it as not necessarily backstabbing or not necessarily betraying NATO interests, but part of uh, new Turkey and part of new regional Turkish objectives. Thank you very much, Mr. Ismailzade. Mr. Jeffrey, the same question, please. Let me repeat it if you want. Okay. Okay. Uh, as 400 air defense system, as you know, YPG, PKK terrorist organization in Syria, and Eastern Mediterranean issues. Mm -hmm. When you consider these issues, important issues or significant issues, is 2022 this year mm -hmm. going to be a hard year? What is your opinion? Right. Between, okay. And between Turkey and USA relations, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all years in, in U.S.-Turkey relations in, in the recent past have been difficult for one way or another, but I think like Professor Reynolds, I'm cautiously optimistic relative to what we've seen in, in the recent past about the, the immediate future. And that's because I do think there's been a recognition in both uh, Washington and Ankara that the tension between the two countries has gotten out of hand and there's been some concrete steps to try and figure out how to overcome some of the most severe breaches between the two of them. Um, we can see this with the Biden administration walking back in support for the uh, East Med gas pipeline, which would have seen uh, Turkey isolated. Um, I think we can see it in the, the ongoing efforts uh, to find a, a resolution to the S-400 issue. Um, I think we can see it in Ukraine, where uh, Turkey has been among the NATO allies, among the most uh, forward-leaning in terms of providing political and military support to the Ukrainians um, at a time when the U.S. has been somewhat frustrated with many of the other NATO allies for um, taking a, a more equivocal approach. And I think that Turkey's greater willingness to do that is symptomatic of, of what uh, Dr. Ismail Zada was talking about, which is this um, more um, strategically autonomous Turkey, one that sees itself as more of a regional power with interests that are not solely um, consigned to uh, the Euro-Atlantic space. That's a process that's been underway in Turkey for quite a while now. Um, I think it even it even predates the, the the coming to power of the AK Party, but certainly the the AK Party government has reinforced it and has given it a kind of durability that I think is going to to last. And the United States and, and the other NATO allies have been, I think, a little bit. Um, it, it's been difficult for them to sort of come to terms with a Turkey that sees itself as a regional power, as, as a country that has uh, interest that it's willing to use force to uh, protect in places like Syria uh, and Black Sea, um, and in other places where that are sort of outside the traditional Euro-Atlantic space, where the, the bilateral relationship is mostly focused. That's not entirely a bad thing. Um, because I think in a lot of ways, uh, Turkish and American interests in these regions are, if not identical, then at least overlapping to, to some degree. And um, with the United States and the Biden administration in particular, focusing on Asia to a greater degree than it has in the past, I think one of the consequences of that is that U.S. allies are going to be pressured to take on a greater role for promoting security and stability in other parts of the world, including in the Euro-Atlantic space. And the fact that you have a country like Turkey that is has a, a diplomatic and military capability that has a vision of itself as a regional player in some of these strategically important areas can light up with the broader U.S. vision of a you know, pivot or whatever we want to call it to Asia. That, of course, means that uh, Turkey is going to take on more of an autonomous role. Its approach and uh, priorities are not always going to coincide with those of the United States. Um, but I think on the larger sort of strategic level, um, they have a, a coincidence of interest, in, including in terms of the relationship with Russia. Um, and I think that, that means that there's not going to be a, a fundamental breach, although there obviously are, are problems. Um, I think another uh, space to watch, and this may be less uh, 2022 and, and more 2023, which is the evolution of Turkish domestic politics. Uh, I think the United States needs to be cautious about not sort of wading into Turkish domestic politics in a way that could create a, a nationalist backlash. I think some of the problems, some of the 
um, the uh, rapprochement with Russia that we saw after 2016 was the result of a perception that the United States had taken sides in internal uh, political issues inside Turkey. And I think with an election coming up and with um, a lot of uncertainty about what the future political course in Turkey is going to look like, the U.S. needs to be careful about not uh, getting caught up in those debates and, and being portrayed as, as favoring one outcome or one candidate um, over another and emphasizing that the enduring nature of bilateral interests and that it'll continue to pursue those regardless of which leader or which party is in charge in Turkey. Thank you very much. And as you know, in Afghanistan, Turkey and USA work closely together. We know that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Defne Arslan. And... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Professor uh, Barbara Oldo. Yeah, okay. May I ask the, the question then? Sure, okay. of course. Could you please evaluate the economic aspects of Turkey-USA relations, taking into account the Ukraine crisis as well? And, and would you like to comment on the previous speaker's comments, please? Uh, of course, uh, Professor Barbirolo, thank you. This is a very uh, good debate with great experts. Uh, you know, let, uh, let me first, if I may, you know, I'd like to start with commenting on the, you know, what we have been discussing, especially I think it is very important what, uh, you know, all panelists have said, but uh, George especially underlined one thing, which I think it's really important, which I agree very much, which is the, you know, the, uh, the difference between, you know, by, uh, foreign policy of Biden administration and uh, previous administration. And also in the meantime, the Turkish foreign policy also sh uh, shifted significantly, uh, which we now see, you know, in the region, as we already have been talking about the rapprochement with Armenia and Israel and, uh, you know, President Erdogan was at the UAE, you know, just yesterday. You know, I wouldn't be believing seeing the Turkish flags in the, you know, a sky, a skyline of uh, Abu Dhabi myself, you know, just, uh, uh, I mean, thinking about how was the world relationship just a couple of years ago. So uh, so there's a shift significantly in both sides. And and I do think that uh, there's a clear, a clear awareness also in the U.S. side that, uh, Turkey uh, has a strategic role to play, you know, just uh, in uh, in the region. And that's why, you know, just Turkey is also in an attempt, uh, you know, just to fix the relationship with, with the region, regional countries. And, uh, and especially talking about Armenia, this is also significantly important uh, for uh, United States as well. Also, as we all know, Armenia is also very close to Russia. So for any Turkey, Armenian rapprochement, uh, which will lead to increased, you know, economic conditions and trade uh, volume between two countries will lead to a be uh, economic welfare in the region, which will, you know, ease Armenia to get closer to the West rather than to Russia. And uh, this is a different, you know, so I will leave it there and I'll come back uh, uh, to your question about the U.S.-Turkey economic relationship. If I may, uh, uh, uh, this also, you know, just I, I do think that with all the China debate going on and also, you know, uh, uh, and also what's happening now in the region, you know, just the Ukraine-Russia conflict and uh, Turkey is being a, you know, significant, uh, is becoming a significant sale, drone sale in the region as well. Uh, first of all, uh, Turkey has a great potential to, uh, to uh, to be a you know uh, to play a role in the supply chain to the world you know just it, Turkey can uh, easily you know step in and provide maybe not all of the you know just uh, sectors but uh, some of them that uh, uh, some of the sectors that you know just where China will be you know emptying uh, the world you know and uh, this is this is number one the second thing is that yes Turkey has been a you know. A major, you know, a importer of Russian gas. But on the other hand, as we look at the data, uh, the, the Turkey has been also diversifying its gas supplies quite significantly in the past years, and this will continue as well. And uh, and we also know that, you know, just recently there has also, also there has also been some shift in the East Med policy of the United States. It's not even though uh, in a very much official rhetoric, but there has been a shift. And uh, and uh, and this uh, Israel Turkey rapprochement is serious. A lot happening be, 
uh, behind, you know, just, and uh, this all will lead to, you know, another, a new term uh, for the region as well, uh, despite all going on. And also, you know, as we look at the, you know, uh, trade and economic uh, data between U.S. and Turkey, the la only last year, you know, Turkey's exports to U.S. increased something like 40 percent. It's a significant job. And uh, for the pa past, past five years, as we look at, you know, the trade volume has been expanding between two countries despite the conflict. Uh, we all know that, you know, there is this rhetoric since the Trump administration about reaching at like 100 uh, a billion dollar trade volume, which I think uh, it's a bit not realistic, but on the other hand, uh, what is the fact is that the economic relationship is also increasing and there's a huge interest by the US business to invest in, uh, in the United States, uh, uh, not maybe that much uh, on the US side to invest in the Turkey, but it will also come. Uh, and uh, I, I'm also, you know, uh, not only on the political front, but also on the economic relation front as well. I'm very optimistic that, uh, you know, uh, this, the relationship is on the right path. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. George Chogopoulos, uh, as you know, EU has 27 countries. 21 of the 27 EU countries are also NATO members, as you know. From this point of view, what do you think about the impact of Turkey-EU relations on Turkey-NATO or Turkey-NATO relations on Turkey-EU relations? This is a very uh, important question, which is not new because it has uh, started to be part of the debate since the Berlin process, like almost 20 uh, years ago. And uh, Turkey has been very skeptical from the very first beginning due to obvious reasons. I don't want to refer to them as I'm, we might need another, another uh, online conference on this Greek, Turkey's tensions, Cyprus questions, question and so on. Uh, the real question in, in, in that regard, as it is being formulated in the main capitals of Europe, uh, Berlin and, and Paris, is uh, up to what extent Turkey uh, can be part of the effort of Europe to uh, formulate its own strategic autonomy and whether this strategic autonomy concept will be endorsed by Washington. Theoretically, there are uh, uh, critical discussions between Brussels and Washington in joining forces because from the moment the United States is shifting its attention to the Indo-Pacific, it is expecting more from Europe in its own backyard. And the Ukraine crisis in particular is making these discussions more intense than ever. It is here where we are. However, at the same time, it is debatable whether new European steps will be in the interest of Turkey. They are certainly in the interest of Greece or the Republic of Cyprus. I remind you that France, the biggest geopolitical uh, power in Europe has signed military agreements, defense pacts with both Greece and the Republic of Cyprus up to what extent new policies of France in that regard will be considered by the United States as steps towards strengthening NATO's southern flank, definitely referred to NATO's southern flank before, or they will be considered by uh, Turkey as steps which are undermining its own interests, which obviously are clashing with the interest of Greece and the interest of Cyprus. It is here where we are right now. And if you allow me also a small comment about the East Med pipeline and whether I'm optimistic about 2022 concerning the Eastern Mediterranean, the real problem is that we have found no solution to the problem. So whether the United States are supporting the East Med pipeline or not, the problem is that there are, there are no decisions made, met by the made by the countries of the neighborhood uh, as on how natural gas will be transported from the reservoirs of the Eastern Mediterranean to Europe. 
And at the same time, there is no agreement yet whether the East Med Gas Forum will include additional countries like Lebanon or Turkey. So the United States needs to mediate in that regard in order to find solutions. As long as solutions have not been found, I am considering the Eastern Mediterranean as the most dangerous sea in the world after the South China Sea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my friend, Dr. George. George. And uh, Dr. Ferit Guliev, in the Ukraine tensions from the energy perspective, is it possible for the EU or NATO to act together against Russia in terms of energy issue? Uh, well, I think that uh, uh, you mean like, Okay, so if uh, whether the uh, European uh, Union can, um, well, uh, the situation is is is that Ukraine is uh, uh, has been a transit for Russian gas to Europe as one of the transit countries, and it also benefits from uh, has benefited from transit transit fees. So in the case that Russia will, uh, you know, re redirect its gas uh, deliveries from uh, North Nord Stream to. Ukraine will uh, is going to lose definitely. Uh, so uh, this is one uh, key issue. Another issue here is that um, for uh, uh, European countries has a you know as you as you know have a has a they have a different discourse right now right. So they are trying to they they have the European Green Deal and they want to sort of um, they reach a net zero target by 2050. So they ultimately, they want to sort of uh, phase out all the fossil fuels because of all this climate change concerns and so on and so forth. And Ukraine is a country that is also uh, quite dependent on fossil fuels. And uh, uh, part, you know, yeah. So the situation here uh, right now is that, um, that these countries might benefit from um, like one way to mitigate this. So what I'm trying to, to argue is that of course the European countries can increase uh, imports uh, from outside of Europe through LN LNG, uh, you know, gas supplies. Uh, but another way is to sort of um, revive this um, idea that, uh, that, that of, of a Southern uh, uh, corridor uh, that has been somehow abandoned for the time being by European uh, Commission and the European Union. Um, yeah, but uh, what the current crisis has shown is that Europe is still heavily dependent on, on uh, uh, Russian gas, despite all the talk about renewable targets and so on and so forth. So uh, what the European Union can do to at least try uh, to mitigate this um, impact is to at least think about the you know, ways they can um, keep their you know, enough gas in storages. And one way of doing this is to, what I was arguing is that they can increase um, exports from, um, from Azerbaijani gas. So of course, there's uh, not uh, Azerbaijani gas is not going to resolve uh, uh, European energy security issues. Um, and, yeah, there is um, uh, also uh, in the past there was a lot of talk about constructing a, a Trans-Caspian uh, pipeline that would connect Turkmenistan uh, to Azerbaijan and uh, so on and so forth. But that pipeline was, uh, it doesn't seem to be feasible right now. And it wasn't uh, feasible back then because of um, Russia and Iran opposed to it actively uh, through various uh, ways. And Turkmenistan would be a nice uh, addition to, to increase this uh, capacity, but Turkmenistan has a long-term uh, commitment uh, to supply its, its uh, export gas to China. Right, so right now they, they don't have Thank you very much. it's not this is not a viable option at the moment. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks. Uh, and uh, yeah, I want to pose this question to all, but uh, for Mr. Ferret, the question will be different. 
will be related to energy, of course. And we have uh, Dr. George Chogopoulos, I think he has to leave on 20, on nine o'clock, huh? after 30 minutes, after 15 minutes. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the first question to you, and this question I, I want to pose to all. When we come to Turkey-Russia relations, there is a positive cooperation between Turkey and Ukraine, as we know. What will be the impact of this cooperation on Turkey-Russia relations? The geopolitical power struggle between USA, NATO, and Russia continues in Ukraine, as we know. How does this struggle between USA and Russia affect Turkey? Well, this is an issue which is uh, largely debated uh, in Europe, where uh, I am based. Uh, as far as the future of uh, Turkey-Russia relations are concerned, what we do observe is that the two countries have uh, forged a, a modus vivendi in a spirit of uh, cooperating despite disagreements they do have. And this is the most important conclusion, which, in my opinion, is uh, uh, characterizing the current status of Turkey's Russian relations, as it is evident that the two have significant disagreements, for example, in Libya or Syria, but in the end, it is possible for them to reach uh, a minimum level of, uh, of understanding. Now, the key question from uh, an American perspective, obviously, uh, is what uh, my fellow colleagues have uh, already uh, uh, described and discussed before. But from a European perspective, I'd like to add that there are certainly divisions in how Europe needs to approach Russia. But the core of Europe, the main capitals like Rome, uh, Berlin or France, they are interested in exploring a, a new security architecture with Russia and the uh, continuation of the Ukraine crisis. And obviously the visits of Chancellor Scholz and President Macron to Moscow are placed in that regard. Up to what extent Turkey will be part of this security architecture, it is an issue that has not been decided yet, but it is currently partly on the agenda in view of the important meeting of the EU Council about the strategic compass next uh, March. It is here where we are. However, I would like to suggest that despite the interest of both EU and Turkey to uh, move their partnership forward, the existing uh, problems in this partnership are damaging uh, additional attempts in order to discuss that kind of issues. So in that sense, I wouldn't be that much optimistic, but once again, I would largely place the potential interest of Europe to cooperate with Turkey in reformulating a future relation with Russia would not necessarily start in Brussels, it will start in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and. Uh... Uh, Mr. George, thank you very much for your participation. And uh, on behalf of Istanbul Aydın University, I would like to thank you for your participation again. And it has, it has been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. My great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, okay. The same question to uh, Mrs. Defna Arslan. When we come yes. to Turkey, Russia, if you want, I can repeat it again. Uh, please, please oh. do so, Professor. Okay. When we come to Turkey Russia relations, there is a positive cooperation between Turkey and Ukraine, as we all know. What will be the impact of this cooperation on Turkey Russia relations? And the other, the geopolitical power struggle between USA, NATO, and Russia continues in Ukraine. How does this struggle between USA and Russia affect Turkey? 
In five minutes, please. <laughs> of course, very quickly, you know, just uh, first of all, um, uh, about that, you know, just I think uh, Turkey has already proven that uh, it can be on the other side of the table uh, in several conflicts in the past, as also uh, George uh, pointed out very well, like in Libya, Syria, and also Nagara Karabakh as well, you know, just, uh, uh, Turkey and uh, Russia were on the, you know, conflicting sides. And, uh, and uh, at that time, again, Turkey were there with it, with the drones co to actually cooperating together with you know also Israel in in uh, in that region of the world, and uh, and also in the Ukraine part, you know Turkey is doing the same thing, you know just so sending drones to Ukraine, showing strategic support to you know Ukraine, and also in the Crimea uh, issue, it, as we all know in the past, you know Turkey also uh, kept its position against Russia. So uh, this will not. This is not the first time this is happening, and will not be the uh, last time as well. As we also looked at the, you know, Russian uh, Ottoman first, and then Turkish relationship in the past as well. But on the other hand, uh, as we have, we all know there is a strategic uh, and economic relations, you know, uh, due to proximity of two countries, also in the region. I think the question that we also need to uh, assess is that what will happen if. Russia really uh, uh, enters Ukraine tomorrow, right? You know, just, uh, and uh, if then, if there will be a NATO involvement as well in the region, as a NATO country, how uh, Turkey needs to be part, uh, on the side of the NATO as well. So what will happen then? That we all don't know, uh, but on the other hand, uh, about tomorrow, I also don't think that uh, what is expected will be happening. Uh, I'm also a bit op optimistic on that side, but this is another five minutes uh, answer, so I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Defne. Mr. Ambassador, uh, I want to pose the same question to you, sir. If you want, I can repeat it again. I can repeat. Uh, no, I think you are already uh, <clears throat> made very clear what the question okay. is. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> uh, the first part of uh, uh, the answer uh, is that Turkey stands to lose dramatically uh, in case of uh, further escalation uh, in the uh, in the situation. Uh, but let me underline the fact that uh, the Ukraine crisis is not between Russia and Ukraine; it's between Russia and the United States. So that's uh, where the solution is going to be found. I am cautiously still optimistic that diplomacy uh, will work. Uh, to the benefit uh, of the resolution uh, of, of this uh, conflict. Uh, but as far as Turkey is concerned, Turkey has uh, extremely uh, important relations with, uh, with uh, Russia, uh, has uh, important relations uh, uh, with uh, Ukraine. Uh, so you cannot, uh, and this is why Turkey has taken a very uh, positive, nuanced uh, attitude toward the conflict uh, by offering its uh, uh, mediation to the two sides, uh, not that it's going to be uh, uh, uh, taken by, uh, uh, by uh, Russia, because Russia is interested uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, further move Turkey away from the Euro-Atlantic community and away from, uh, away from NATO. So uh, Turkey has uh, high stakes in the resolution of the Ukraine crisis uh, by non-military uh, means. Uh, as far as uh, uh, uh, the NATO connection is concerned, yes, NATO is a, uh, Turkey is a NATO ally and it must uh, act as an ally. Uh, but I think it's in a bind here. Uh, uh, on the one hand, you have uh, responsibilities as a, as a NATO uh, ally. And then on the other hand, uh, you have uh, extensive, crucial relations uh, with uh, Russia. So it's going to take a lot of uh, uh, wise, uh, rational, slow, quiet effort by Turkey uh, to protect uh, uh, both sides of the fence uh, uh, for its, uh, uh, in favor of its national uh, interests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, Mr. Reynold, please, the same question. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think no, no, I, I, I, have, I think I have the question. Um, 
I, the first thing I'd like, I'd like to uh, say about the Turkey's role in the, the crisis with Ukraine is that uh, the Turkish interest in an independent Ukraine isn't anything new. In fact, it dates to 1918 uh, when uh, Ukraine first emerged as an independent state uh, during the uh, uh, process of the signing the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Um, and I'll just point out that uh, Turkish military intelligence at the time actually emphasized that uh, the most important development taking place in the Russia Eurasian space was the emergence of an independent Ukraine, that this was far more important to the um, checking of Russian power than anything that uh, uh, Russia's Muslims might do. Um, so contrary to sort of this assumption that Turkey's always had this fantasy about uh, Russian, about the Muslims of Eurasia as being a key aspect to, to check Russian power or key actor, or key um, uh, factor in uh, balancing Russian power. In fact, even in 1918, uh, Ottoman uh, strategists recognized the importance of an independent uh, Ukraine. In fact, the Ottoman Empire in, its, in the last months of the war did what it could to support uh, Ukraine. So there's nothing new there. Um, I, I mentioned, I think, at the beginning of, uh, of this conference, the fact that Turkey's support of Ukraine, in particular, its supplying of uh, drones, uh, contrasts in particular to the uh, attitude of some other uh, NATO allies uh, who have been, particularly Germany, has been less hesitant, has been much more hesitant uh, to support Ukraine militarily. And this has really helped uh, uh, restore, I want to say, has boosted Turkey's reputation in certain circles in, in, in Washington, D.C., and there's reminded people of the potential value, or the real value, I should say, of Turkey um, as a, a NATO ally. On the other hand, you know, Turkey does, of course, uh, run risk here as it, it demonstrates its importance both to Russia and the United States. As, and as becomes more important to both of them, uh, it also runs the risk of then having to pay the price if it's on one side or the other. In other words, uh, another way of putting this, I'm sure Moscow is not pleased at all with what Turkey is doing. And Moscow has shown it has a way, has an ability not just to um, retaliate against Turkey, but in fact, to bend uh, Turkey to its will. Now, there are you know, the, m many of the avenues of uh, leverage that Moscow has over Turkey are also avenues of Turkish leverage over Moscow. That is, if it sells, if Russia sells uh, energy to Turkey, for example, uh, it also uh, needs that uh, income uh, that it, re it gets uh, uh, from Turkey. And I think here, uh, perhaps paradoxically, one of the cards that Turkey has to play with Russia is the fact that um, Russia's, I think, been primarily interested in, in sort of using Turkey as a um, an instrument, if you will. I'm trying, I can't think of a better term right now. An instrument to sort of provoke uh, disruption inside of NATO and confusion. And uh, Turkey, there still is that possibility as long as Turkish-American relations remain uh, contentious. And despite, I say that my relative optimism for this year, I don't think those relations are going to be 100% perfect anytime soon. In fact, I don't expect that to ever happen. And so there is that possibility that perhaps Turkey will preserve itself from uh, serious retaliation from Russia for what it's doing in support of Ukraine, um, because Moscow re recognizes, well, down the road, uh, being able to uh, use Turkey to shake up NATO or to, to sow doubt in, the, in that alliance is still uh, a possibility, and therefore it would be better to sort of keep relations with Turkey uh, uh, relatively cordial. Thank you very much for your comment, Mr. Reynolds. And uh, to Mr. Ismail Zadeh, the same question. If you want, I repeat. Uh, I, no, no, no need. I uh, for, for first, I would like to say that the situation around Ukraine has really once again proved that Turkey is a very reliable NATO ally. There were many discussions in the past years that NATO and Turkey are drifting apart, that Turkey is uh, selling out NATO interests uh, and uh, becoming closer with Russia. But uh, on the position of Ukraine, on the situation of Ukraine, really Turkey firmed up once again its NATO uh, alliance and has stood up for Ukraine, stood up for NATO interests. And that is once again showing that uh, Turkey is an important player in Euro-Atlantic community. And also I want to uh, repeat um, some of the arguments that we have discussed, uh, that the uh, you know, Turkish-Armenian rapprochement, Turkish-Armenian normalization, as well as Turkish-Israeli normalization, Turkish-UAE uh, normalization, is opening a new opportunity for Turkey to be even more effective player in the region. I think that this will diminish the pressure from some of the 
ethnic lobby groups that exist in the United States. Uh, Ambassador Lologlu spoke about it in the beginning. Uh, the pressure from Armenian lobby will definitely decrease because uh, everyone will see that Turkish Armenian rapprochement and normalization is better for the region and better for the Armenia. And it's even very much supported by the executive branch of the US government. So uh, definitely pressure from anti-Turkish groups will decrease and this will further help to um, uh, strengthen the US-Turkish relationships, at least at the level of executive branch. So I'm very optimistic about these opportunities. And I also believe that uh, sooner or later, the international community will see that some of the hawkish, uh, nationalistic, and uh, you know, hate, full of hatred radical groups among Armenian diaspora are really counterproductive to the regional peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just I need one, your comment on this issue. How do you evaluate the Ukraine crisis? Do you consider the Ukraine crisis as Russia-Ukraine crisis or Russia-USA-NATO crisis? Short answer. No, definitely, definitely this is a continental crisis. This is uh, not, uh, has nothing to do with uh, Ukraine itself, but rather the security uh, concerns uh, of, of Russia, as well as um, sort of the general uh, power balance in the region, which has been severely broken since 1990s. And this uh, puts Russia in a very uh, insecure position. So I would say this is much bigger continental crisis than just relationship between Ukraine and Russia. Thank you very much for your comment, Mr. Ismail Zade. And uh, Mr. Jeffrey? I want to pose the same question. If you want, I can repeat it. No, that, that's okay. Thank you. So I, I think that the Ukraine crisis is is potentially quite dangerous for Turkey. Um, Turkey has uh, seen the regional balance of power shift against it, against it in the Black Sea rather substantially since Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. Um, and not only the annexation, but then the subsequent militarization, the rebuilding of the Russian Black Sea Fleet um, has already had a, a negative impact on, on Turkey's security perceptions in the region. And I think that a further um, Russian invasion, one that consolidates control over a greater part of Ukrainian territory, a greater part of the Black Sea littoral, um, obviously has very negative security implications for Turkey, much as it did um, at the end of, of the First World War and the Russian Civil War, when, when the nascent Soviet Union reabsorbed Ukraine. Um, at the same time, Turkey has shown um, a proclivity for balancing uh, between its commitments to NATO and this burgeoning partnership with Russia. Uh, this partnership with Russia is a very complicated one um, because on the one hand, there are a whole range uh, of uh, conflicts between the two countries around a, an ever widening geographic region, uh, one that encompasses now Libya, Syria, the South Caucasus, um, and potentially Ukraine uh, as well. And I, I agree with what Professor Reynolds said about how Russia has been willing to, to tolerate a certain degree of friction with Turkey in these areas because of the value that it gains from having Turkey as a disaffected member of the Western Alliance. I think though that there's a difference when it comes to Ukraine because for Russia, Ukraine plays a much more central role. This issue of how Ukraine fits into the broader European security architecture and what the nature of the Russo-Ukrainian relationship is matters a lot more in Moscow than what happens in Libya or even what happens in Syria. And that, so I I think for that reason that Russia is willing to pay a higher price uh, in order to secure its objectives vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine, and that could have implications for Turkey. So far, uh, I think Russia has been relatively cautious in terms of uh, responding to Turkey's sale of um, armed drones and other uh, military assistance to Ukraine, uh, as it has vis-a-vis uh, -vis other Western countries who've, who've similarly, be, similarly been supplying uh, military equipment to Ukraine. In the event that there actually is a conflict and I've throughout the the current buildup been uh, cautiously optimistic that there won't there won't be a large conflict and I still continue to believe that if there were to be however um, certainly I think Russia would put a lot of pressure on Turkey uh, to walk back uh, its support for Ukraine to walk back particularly its military uh, military technical cooperation with Ukraine and that could focus on uh, pressure points that exist throughout this broader geography as well as on the economic front. So we could see economic sanctions like the ones that we saw in 2015. Uh, we could see uh, energy sanctions. Um, I actually don't think that the 
um, the energy sales to Turkey um, are that uh, significant for the Russian economy in the short term, especially because Russia has built up a lot of foreign currency reserves and it can endure um, a downturn in, in the income from energy sales for a, a significant period of time. Um, but also in places like Syria, uh, Russia maintains a relationship with the YPG, PKK, which doesn't get talked about as much as the U.S. relationship with those organizations, but Russia has one as well, uh, one that it's been more than willing to leverage uh, to achieve its, its strategic ends at different points. Um, there's still the question of Idlib and Russia's ability to bring pressure against that in a way that could uh, put Turkish allies under pressure, that could put uh, more refugee pressure uh, on Turkish borders uh, in Syria um, and in different in some of these other theaters as well. Um, so I, I think that Turkey has been able to balance uh, reasonably effectively uh, between Russia and NATO uh, thus far. But should uh, NATO and Russia really come into a conflict over Ukraine, I think Turkey is going to find itself in a fairly vulnerable position. And I expect that Russia will take steps to try and exacerbate that vulnerability. Thank you very much, Mr. Jeffrey. Uh, Dr. Farid, I want to pose this question concerning energy, of course. The geopolitics power struggle continues in the Black Sea, Ukraine, Eastern Mediterranean, Syria, and Libya. In terms of geopolitics of energy security, how does this struggle between the USA and Russia affect Turkey and other countries? What is your opinion? What do you think about that, sir? Uh, okay, thank you for your question. Uh, I think uh, uh, generally when we talk about geopolitics of energy, what we mean is that uh, that uh, supplies or transportation uh, ro ro routes and, uh, and all this control over this are uh, can become political tools for countries and uh, will uh, as a foreign policy tool that they can use. Um, <clears throat> so in, in, in that sense, we definitely see that uh, I, I think in, in the past and also and now uh, in the case of the um, and, uh, gas markets in, in Europe that uh, Russia is at least trying to use its, um, you know, European dependence on, on, on, on its gas supplies as a potential weapon, uh, what is called an uh, energy weapon, uh, and also as a diplomat diplomatic tool. On the other hand, what is um, uh, also interesting to observe is that the United States has become itself has become a major oil exporter uh, thanks to this fracking revolution in, in the U.S. So it's now also um, competing with other uh, energy suppliers in Europe and elsewhere. Um, and the, in the, uh, the current situa situation in the energy market shows that um, you know when uh, there are shortages uh, of uh, Russian supplies, so European countries. Uh, you know, they increase their, they, they buy more of LNG gas, uh, which is at least partly sourced from, from the U.S. So <clears throat> I think, yeah, that's def definitely happen happening. But what I'm trying to say that if, if Europe is going to reduce at least dependence on Russia, at least partly, I think Turkey here can play a key role because as I mentioned, uh, natural gas is considered to be an important uh, transitional fuel for countries that are trying to uh, shift to uh, clean energy sources. And for the time being, this uh, is, of course, a renewable transition is not going to happen immediately. It's going to take decades and decades of, um, um, um, of um, efforts to, you know, to, to introducing clean technologies and so on and so forth. So, in the medium term, uh, this inc increases the role of natural gas. And one source of this, of course, there's, there are other sources of, of gas also in Algeria is, for example, major supplier to Europe from North, North uh, Africa. There is also Norway and so on and so forth. But in some of these countries, there is a result of domestic pressure to, um, you know, to, uh, to stop producing fossil fuels because of climate change concerns, like in countries like Norway, for example, there is a lot of, um, environmental, uh, there's a very strong environmental movement against this. So I think, uh, yeah, so uh, Turkey can be, can um, again, uh, uh, what it shows is that uh, the current crisis is that it, it, it uh, because of its geography as well, it can become an, an energy transit uh, hub for non-Russian gas. And in this way, 
sort of increases its, its uh, geopolitical leverage and geopolitical power in, in, in this in Black Sea region, for example. Thank you very much, Mr. Ferry. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So uh, we have 15 minutes left now. And I think uh, uh, Mrs. Defna Arslan has to leave us, I think, in short time. Apologies that I thought that this was going to uh, end at 1 p.m. U.S. Uh, uh, time and I need to run for another meeting, but this has been a lovely debate and I really thank you very much. So until next time, thank you. Okay, I need to okay thank you. Just, just may I have your last comments in two minutes, please? Sure, okay. Please, please. Oh, on, the, on the same issues. Oh, okay. So not a different question on the same issues. Yeah, of course. Uh, so uh, uh, before I wrap up, you know, just so I agree that, you know, just uh, in the region, especially, you know, uh, um, on the, you know, energy front or, you know, U.S. Uh, Turkey relations front, you know, just uh, all the recent developments will play a significant role. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, just Turkey already proved to be a, you know, uh, strategic partner you know, uh, in the region and uh, and also an ally, despite all, you know, the disagreements, you know, just with uh, the United States uh, that it had over several issues. So that's what I will say. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, Miss, Mrs. Arslan, uh, you have provided us with very important and useful information. On behalf of Istanbul Aydın University, I would like to thank you for your significant contributions. It has been a pleasure to have you here in our university. Thank you a lot. Thanks a thank lot. You, thank you very much. And my fellow panelists as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good evening. Now, yeah, we, yeah, we have 15 minutes left. And Mr. Ambassador, just last comments in two or three minutes between USA and the USA and Turkey relations in the context of global and regional issues. Global uh, comments, please, in two or three minutes. Uh, thank you, yes. <laughs> uh, in uh, the light of what I said earlier, uh, I'm glad I participated in this uh, uh, webinar about the near future of Turkish-American relations than I personally uh, see. Uh, but, uh, you know, I bow uh, to those who, who feel uh, that uh, uh, there is a chance uh, for improvement uh, in Turkish-American relations uh, in the near, uh, in the near uh, future. Uh, my uh, concluding uh, comment uh, it will be uh, that uh, uh, this relationship, Turkish-American relationship, uh, has faced many challenges before. Uh, it has endured. It has come true. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in, the, in the long run, not in the near uh, future, but in the long run, uh, this uh, relationship uh, will survive. Why? Uh, because uh, Turkey is important uh, for the United States. And the U.S. is important for uh, Turkey. I uh, put that uh, notion of importance in quotation marks. Uh, it has uh, strategic dimensions. It has historical dimensions, economic, commercial, whatnot. And there is a very uh, a strong, powerful Turkish-American community. Its uh, number is small, uh, but it's highly professional, composed of medical doctors, engineers, architects, academicians, and so forth. But because their numbers are small and uh, evenly scattered across uh, the geography of the US, uh, they are not uh, really uh, uh, effective uh, politically as uh, the Jewish, the Armenian, or the Greek lobbies uh, are uh, in the US. Uh, thank you again for giving uh, this opportunity to us. Uh, and I thank the other panelists for their contributions. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, Mr. Reynolds, last comments, please, on the panel. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, US, I think maybe, uh, USA Turkey relations in the context of global and regional issues. Just right. I think, I think 
Yes, I, I, I think I'll, I'll make uh, two points, um, which I, I, ma I made earlier, but I'll, I'll, I'll restate them now. And I, that is, I think, one of the uh, uh, key determinants of Turkish-U.S. relations and one that bodes for the improvement of those relations is uh, the recognition by Washington, which I hope this will occur, of the limits of American power. And um, as Washington realizes uh, that it, it does not have the resources and the power that it had, let's say, two decades ago, let alone three decades ago, um, there will be a greater appreciation both for the importance of Turkey uh, and its utility to the United States and also recognition that the United States can't so um, blithely uh, violate uh, Turkish vital interests, such as it has done in uh, Syria with the, with the YPG and, that, and, it has, and, and as it has done with uh, Fethullah Gulen. That's a complicated issue. I won't go into it now, um, but I think that bodes well for the improvement of uh, Turkish-American relations. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is the problem of uh, rebuilding, or let me say not so much rebuilding, but rather revitalizing uh, Turkey's institutions, which have really uh, uh, suffered quite a lot in the last decade in, in, in particular. Um, and by that, I mean uh, things like Turkish universities, uh, its uh, diplomatic corps, its it, the military have all witnessed a tremendous amount of upheaval uh, over the past uh, decade. And it will be essential for Turkey if it's going to be able to fill the sort of vacuum that I foresee emerging um, as the United States is challenged both in, in Turkey's neighborhood and around the world. Uh, Turkey, in order to effectively step up into that uh, <clears throat> environment, is going to need far better institutions than what it has right now. Um, and you know, one of the things that Turkey has demonstrated with the, uh, the drones in particular and uh, more generally Turkey's uh, defense uh, industry and its uh, successes, that Turkey, in fact, can project power and it can become a more influential player in the region. But I want to just call people's attention to the fact that the production of those drones isn't a product of the last five or 10 years, but really goes back many decades. And that's sort of the road that I think Turkey needs to get back on uh, if it's going to uh, both not simply play a larger role in the region, but protect its own interests and uh, protect its own peace and prosperity. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, Mr. Ismail Zade, general comments, please. Mr. Ismail Zade. I think he left. Uh, okay, Mr. Jeffrey, <laughs> we have three minutes for you. Okay, sure. Um, I'll try to be brief then. I think that one of the challenges and opportunities in terms of U.S.-Turkey relations right now is there are a whole plethora of other problems um, that both of these countries face. Um, with the U.S., um, there is everything from domestic political challenges to dealing with China, uh, to climate, to, to everything else. And for Turkey, we've talked about a lot of these on the panel already. And in that environment, I think both countries have to make a determination about just how much tension in the bilateral relationship they can afford. Um, they both um, have interest in, in maintaining a productive relationship and in cooperating across a range of issues. There are obviously going to be areas of significant disagreement. Uh, I think Syria uh, is one. I think you know, Turkey's purchase of, of the Russian S-400 and the broader relationship with Moscow is another. But at the same time, um, on many of the, there are many larger issues that both of these countries have to confront. And I think in that context, there is an opportunity for both to recognize the need for at least having a productive uh, partnership between the two of them so that they can focus on these other things. Um, I'll go back to what I said before about the US pivot to Asia. Uh, this has been the strategic preference, the priority for US administrations going back over a decade now. Um, they've been constrained from doing that because of the continued outbreak of crises and problems in other parts of the world, including the Middle East and Europe. Uh, I think to the extent that the United States is going to be serious about ever giving substance to this pivot to Asia, it needs to recognize um, the importance of working with partners and giving partners, including Turkey, uh, a greater role in managing some of the problems in these other regions of the world. And that means 
uh, trying to fix the bilateral relationship. It means accepting a greater, de of a greater degree of independence and autonomy in terms of the foreign policy of, of countries like Turkey. Um, and it means uh, thinking about new um, institutional uh, formats for doing this, you know, whether this is uh, inside NATO, whether it's uh, on a more bilateral or even a minilateral level. Uh, I think the, the opportunity for, for new geometries and, and for extending the partnership to think about how to, how to cope with new problems is, is very much there as both the US and Turkey now think about how to get along and how to advance their priorities in a more complicated world. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jeffrey. And uh, the last comments from Mr. Farid, please. Mr. Farid, yeah. The last general comments, please. We have three or four minutes for you. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, so Turkey is the uh, role as a regional power, uh, I believe has, has increased in the past years as demonstrated by its role that it played in the uh, uh, Karabakh conflict, for example, and the role that is now playing uh, to counter, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, crisis in Ukraine. So I think uh, Turkey has demonstrated that it has uh, it can play, it can have a, you know, a pretty independent policy um, uh, as we, uh, we have witnessed that Ukraine, uh, in the case of Ukraine, Turkey has, has been consistently, uh, has consistently insisted on, on recognizing the territorial integrity of Ukraine, despite the fact that this, this could provoke some kind of disagreements from Russia, which is also in, uh, with, with, with which it, it, it has a pretty interesting relationships. So um, I think the uh, ability, the, the, the, the uh, fact that uh, Turkey and Russia can sort of um, agree on certain issues is also um, can be best explained by the fact that their relationships are pretty pragmatic, I would say, in the sense that they all both countries have foreign policy kind of models that are um, uh, based on some sort of transactional relationship. So they can negotiate certain bargains and certain theaters in the Middle East and in, in the Caucasus and so on and so forth. So uh, I believe this is going to continue as some experts have been arguing that the US has been disengaging from this region. And so in a way, this disengagement creates a um, Freeze, freeze up space for uh, regional uh, um, uh, countries with um, uh, powers with ambitions to project their power in, in uh, those uh, regions that were previously U United States played a much stronger role, such as in the South Caucasus, on in, in the Syrian front, on, in, in other parts of him. Uh, thank you very much. Thank and uh, Mr. Ambassador, Dear participants, now just I want to make some comments on the issue. Okay. Here are the results I found from the panel. In particular, four crises that have tested USA and Turkey relations. Turkey's purchase of the Russian-made S-400 air defense systems and the ensuing USA sanctions on Turkey, YPG, PKK terrorist organization, the Eastern Mediterranean crisis, and Ukraine crisis. A mutually acceptable solution on the US S-400 system is unlikely to be found anytime soon, and these issues is said to become a long-lasting irritant in the relationship. On the Eastern Mediterranean, at the best, the crisis can be frozen with mutual talks between the two countries. Plus, on the Eastern Mediterranean, we are likely to see more policy coordination between USA and Europe. As the USA will continue to support YPG, PKK terrorist organization in Syria, this will continue to be an important problem area between two countries. In Ukraine crisis, NATO member Turkey should be able to remain neutral between USA, NATO, and Russia. And Mr. Ambassador, dear participants, 
You have provided us with very important and useful information. It was very efficient panel. On behalf of Istanbul Aydın University, I would like to thank you for your significant contribution. It has been a pleasure to have you here in our university. It has been an honor to me, for me, to be the moderator for, of this event. My respects to all of you. Hope to see you on another panel. Good evening. And for USA, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.